Hey, good people. So uh, it's been a while since we vlogged. Uh, today I'm in New Jersey with Seth of Bucolic. And today we're going to get burritos and talk about a lot of cool things. Hey, so I'm in the Casa de Bucolic and I just got some dope ass burritos at Dia de los. What was it called again? Dia de los burritos. Dia de los burritos. And I'm with Seth, and we're going to talk about the ins and outs of recording and the different gear that Seth uses to make the sound that is Bucolic. So, first off, Seth, what is Bucolic? Bucolic is my project that I started about four years ago. Um, I've been writing music for a long, long time, and finally, through years of trial and error, I decided to really... Put it all into one thing and come up with a sound, a sound that's unique to me and I don't really know what you describe it as. A lot of people say dream pop, a lot of people say shoegaze, a lot of people say I'm not sure. I just know that it's kind of inspired heavily by nature, hence the name. And a lot of experimenting but also delivered in a semi-accessible package. Rock solid. So, can you take us through the guitars that you use um, in Bucolic? Sure, I got two. This is my baby, who is damaged right now. It's a Fender Jaguar, Kurt Cobain model, because you can't get a cool guitar that's a Fender without, be, without it being a Kurt Cobain model. That's so real. And you're a lefty too, right? Yep, I am a lefty. No diss to Kurt Cobain, but I was never the biggest Nirvana fan. But... <laughs> <laughs> I love this guitar though. It's fucking awesome. It's a dream guitar. And uh, my other one, which I bought about a little under a year ago, is my Dan Electro U2. Not exactly sure what year it's from, but I believe it's early 2000s. I got this used at a uh, guitar shop, and I love it. It's kind of a. It's made out of masonite, I believe it is. It's like this. Uh, particle board and hollow on the inside so it's semi-hollow it's got a really cool kind of jazzy tone and I love this thing a lot the Jaguar is a little more uh, what's the word I'm looking for you get a lot more out of it but this thing's awesome I love it. gotcha gotcha alright next let's talk about gear uh, let's talk about your synths first cool uh, well this is not a synth but it's an organ um, synths in a second, but I found this on a country road in somebody's front yard. Apparently this guy's mother had just passed away and they were clearing out the house. Mm -hmm. And it was sitting in the middle of this big farm like property and mm -hmm. I walked into the yard and he said, do you want it? And I picked it up and not by myself, I'm not that strong. But Dude, I, this thing, like it's, it's, it's definitely not light. It's a beast. You can hear like, when you turn it on it like mm -hmm. hums, like there's some old school machinery in there it's pretty cool i use it for like sort of ambient i'll kind of sample that true and, like, mess with it for some background noise i don't really use it straight up that much but it's a cool piece nice shelf and true you can get some good sounds out of it next um i've had a number of synths and i've also kind of moved into the midi world begrudgingly but found this at a goodwill Sack, dude. The best Goodwill I've ever found, uh, find I've ever got. It's a Casio MT-210. This thing's awesome. It's got like the cheesy old 80s uh, rhythm and a lot of really cool sounds actually with some decent uh, chorus and reverb and sustain. This, this thing's awesome. Um, that's pretty new to my collection, but I'm excited to get a lot of use out of that. My... Um, SP-404, which is Bucolic wouldn't be Bucolic without it, mm -hmm. because I'm a one-man one man band, but I also like some other stuff going on besides my guitar, so what I do is I record my music, and I take out guitar or synth or whatever it is I want to play live with the song and the vocals, and I play with the track, and you know I also use this to actually sample, but what I typically use it for is just to play tracks on stage sweet and you know i do sample and put that into my songs as well so you know i use it to build the songs i use it to play the songs and yeah this is like my favorite thing ever um also 
For pedals, I have a very nasally, kind of annoying voice, and... That's a lie, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) You can't be a shoegaze, dream pop-ish band without having a lot of reverb, and to make up for what I think is lacking in my voice, I got some a doubler here, which also has like a, a group vocal type thing where you can get like octaves above and below, get some reverb on there. This this is my, uh, if you've listened to my music, I have a real kind of hazy megaphone effect that I sing a lot of my stuff through, and that's created by this. This is also has a really good reverb on it. I think Roland makes the best reverb. Uh, the reverb on my sampler and this thing are amazing. Dude, I completely agree with that. Yeah, Roland yeah. is the best. Yeah. And even the, uh, I've had an SB202 and a 303, the Doctor sample, I think it was called, like all their effects are amazing. Their vinyl effect is the coolest. They need to make a pedal out of that because that's, it's, I, I honestly want to buy an SP404, extend my giant pedal board about another 10 inches just so I can plug my guitar into it. True. The vinyl effect is so good on that. But, um, then we got this big old hunk that I made. I make um, pedal boards out of old suitcases. Blue tree boards, if anybody's interested on Facebook and all that Instagram and stuff. We'll put that link in the go to old description section. Yeah, I um, do that on the side and I can, uh, you know, that's not really a business, but I make them. I've sold quite a few and people seem to be pretty happy with them. But my personal one. Is, uh, it's not as pretty as the one I make for other people. It's just a big old thing with uh, with some wood. And fun fact, the first instrument I ever learned to play was the piano. And this board that raises the pedals on the back was cut off that old piano. And um, so I got a lot of pedals. Maybe not that much, but I run through a tuner and a compression and sustainer pedal which is pretty much the basics for your first couple pedals in a row. My alignment is sort of not conventional because I don't really know what the hell I'm doing with any of this stuff, so I don't learn things by the books. I just figure out what I want my sound to be and completely disregard what people think that I should do. Mm -hmm. Not because I'm some cool, unique guy, because I'm too lazy to read. (laughs) Um, yeah, I just like figuring it out the hard way, as we talked about before. Sweet. So, uh, so I got the tuner, uh, compressor pedal, got my Canyon Electroharmonix Canyon Delay, which is really neat. I've gone through a lot of different delay pedals in the past, and this is like, it's got just enough weird, kind of funky, experimental sounds to it, and you got like 10 settings, and but it, it's also got really nice, basic, just uh, delay effects that I like. I like a good balance between some weird stuff, you know, some like, uh, what's it called? Uh, like, I'll think of it in a minute. But there's a pedal brand that makes stuff that's just like a little too hard to actually use. Like, you mm. make a lot of noise with that. Oh, Earthquaker. I was actually going to say Earthquaker, yeah. yeah. I've made, I've had a bunch of their pedals too, and they're amazing. Like, the, the sounds you can get are super cool, but like, it's, they're kind of unpredictable and weird, and unless you're like a noise band or get something really simple, they're kind of difficult sometimes. So I, I sold my Earthquaker, which was an amazing pedal, but I wanted something that was a little bit easier to use, so that's why I got this one. This Afterglow Chorus is like super cheap and really nice, actually. It's very basic. There isn't really much like, you know, it doesn't bend a lot. It's pretty straightforward, but I'm not like the biggest chorus person in the world, which, mm-hmm. I, which I know uh, my fellow Dream Pop shoegazers won't like me for that but I'm not really that chorus heavy but that thing's awesome it was like 40 bucks or something and it does the job plus I play through a jazz chorus so if I need any more favorite amp by the way yeah they're amazing downsized from a twin reverb to that and to save my arm when carrying but I love that amp then I got a boiler maker boost pedal shout out to Indiana is that where they're from? Yeah, Boilermaker is uh, the Purdue. That's funny. I was going to say, where the hell they're from. Yeah, Purdue like, University, yeah. Boilermakers. The thing was like 20 bucks or something. It's awesome, though. It, it does the job. It's pretty pretty straightforward. And I got a fuzz face distortion, which by itself I'm not really crazy about. Mm. But my whole guitar sound is kind of based around 
a combination of that compressor pedal, this reverb, but this is the main thing. I got the Zvex Instant Lo-Fi Junkie, and that is like, it's compression and chorus, and it's got a tone knob, and it basically kind of makes it sound like you're playing through a vinyl. You're playing, it gives it the, the vinyl, warm vinyl sound. That's awesome. So the fuzz face is, you know, it's, it's fine for a lot of people, but it's a little tinny for me. But True. the fuzz face through the lo-fi junkie is like this super beefy, warm, awesome sound. So I, I love that combination. And that like pretty much any of these pedals on their own, I could take or leave. But I've gone through so many and like combining all of them. Basically anything I buy, I base around whether or not it's going to play well with that. And True. all of these do. So that is, that's the real hero of the pedal board. Then, um... I got this deadbeat reverb pedal. Recently. I've used that. Uh, shout out to Bartis, but my friend Bartis Strange from DC uses that same pedal. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, man, this is awesome. I um like the delay. I've been through a million different reverb pedals, and I'll probably change again eventually. But they uh, this is set up like the uh, Moog Moog or Fuger pedals, as you can see. It looks almost exactly like one, but it's not made by Moog. Their reverberation station, it's got, uh, what, nine different reverb settings. It's cool. It, it's cool. You got the, uh, the color knob, too, not just the reverb and decay. The color, you can make it a little more spacey and beef up the reverb a bit. But that thing, that's an awesome pedal. It was, like, for the price and the, uh, the range of sounds you can get out of that, it's really cool. I'm enjoying it a lot. But I'll probably get another one one day because that's just what I'm like. <laughs> and then, uh... This is my Jam Man Stereo, which is a looper pedal, and it also does rhythm, which I never used. But that is, uh, I've gone through a lot of looper pedals, and that's, I've actually bought and sold this thinking that, um, I'm going to find something better like two times, and then I bought it again. Because <laughs> this thing is awesome. There's just, like, you can line up loops, you can have re record for, like, 18 hours, depending on your SD card, and... Yeah, it's amazing. I don't. I use it a lot for like in between songs, for like uh, ambient stuff. But I don't use it that much live. But for writing songs as a one man band, it's great because I'll just sit there and doodle with this and make loops. And then once I find something that kind of feels right, then I'll take that and then throw it, throw it on the computer and build off that. But that's like a lot of my song writing starts there because I'll just start strumming one thing and try and build on that and then once I get a little something I'll throw it on there and try and expand from there so that thing's essential as well so uh yeah that's that's my board so I think the two m most important things for my live performance and writing are definitely my board and my sampler everything else I can kind of get through MIDI stuff I uh was uh didn't really want to move to MIDI because I was a uh, hardcore and eventually I gave in because it is a lot easier and there is a lot of cool MIDI things out there that you can add sorry guys the camera cut off hashtag phone problems um, so you were talking about MIDI so what are your feelings about MIDI uh, kind of like a lot of music all like I used to be a lot snobbier than I am now about mm -hmm. like certain bands like my whole life I'd be that, you know, assume since something's popular and accessible that it sucks, but that's not really the case because there's a lot of amazing bands out there that are super popular and accessible. And in my ripe old age of 27, I've come to realize that a lot of the stuff that I hated on before, there's really no reason for it. Granted, if there's a certain sound you're going for, MIDI's just not going to cut it sometimes, but I don't really... Uh, I don't really give a crap how I get to where I'm going. And um, I like hardware too, because a lot of that you can get like vintage stuff. And, you know, a MIDI plugin on Logic doesn't compare to an old Casio that you find in Goodwill. Or like I True. have a Casio Tune 401 upstairs that's actually in need of repair. But you just can't get that stuff on MIDI, like that warmth and like the little bit of dirtiness that True. comes through an actual synth or something like that. So I was hesitant to do that. 
Plus, I like having, being able to put my hands on something, too. Like, really sit there and hold something and look through it. And MIDI, it just kind of felt like it was cheating. But I am a one-man band, and there is a million and ten things that you can do with MIDI. So eventually I gave in and got that keyboard, which is really nice. And I've just been sort of learning that as I learn to record more and more and get farther and further into Logic. I've started to allow MIDI into my songwriting and... It's cool, man. There's like, you know, there's endless shit that you can do with that, and I don't need to be a snob about it. There's plenty, True. There's plenty of good noises on MIDI as well. True. So my last question before we move on to the podcast, which, by the way, guys, check out our podcast, check it out. Um, is what is the most rewarding thing about using all this gear in your songwriting process? That's a good question. I think um, the journey of being a solo artist and trying to figure out what works for me, because, you know, I have these grandiose visions of what my song should be, and I've sort of had that in my mind for a long time, but I had to learn what was going to help me get there. It's like you want, you know what you're, you want your house to look like, but you don't know what tools you need to build it, and through experimenting and trial and error, buying stuff, selling stuff, trading stuff, I finally like come to this cool little den of gear that really just, I have everything I need to get where I'm going now. And that's like super rewarding to have gone through the last 10 years of buying stuff and trying stuff. And it's neat, you know, I don't have like the craziest stuff ever, but it fits what my vision of what my sound should be. And I'm sure I'll buy plenty more. But for now, I got everything I need, and that's cool. Perfect. Shout out to you, Seth. Shout out to you. Thanks. 